Amen. It's me. Early appearance this morning. Welcome everybody to our time of worship and uh, glad you're here today to spend this Sunday with us here at uh, First Brethren Church. Um, announcements, uh, Martha told me to uh, remind everybody to get your poinsettia monies, money in for ordering, that that time is coming up. Even if you don't have the money, if you want a poinsettia, put the form in the, in the offer, offering plate or hand it to Martha. Um, that was the only announcement. Are there any other announcements that I missed? Good. Um, let's get into the call to worship. Um, I wanted to read a short scripture here as we get into our, put our hearts into worship. It comes from uh, John chapter 1, verse 14. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. It's very uh, humbling to think that God cared enough for us to send his son uh, to die for our sins. And of course, this time of the year, we're beginning to celebrate the sending of our Savior as a baby. And uh, the very last verse of the song, O Come All Ye Faithful, is um, now in flesh appearing. And that kind of, when you think about that, it's like God was willing to come and be incarnated in you and me if we are willing to be his hands and feet. My challenge to you today is, are we willing to be his hands and feet? We know we live in a different world now with COVID and all the restrictions, but uh, there are lots of things that we can do as believers in Christ. And uh, he's expecting us to not sit by idly, but to be engaged in the world and to make a difference in people's lives. Um, we need to go out and find new ways to do this. So my challenge for you today is to open your hearts and ask him in. <clears throat> Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you and bless you for this day. We thank you for your many blessings that you have given us uh, leading up to this day. And Lord, as we, as we come together and we think about those who are in our fellowship that can't be here because of sickness, Lord, we ask that you put your anointing hand upon them, Lord, and, and give them strength and give them uh, courage to face the challenges ahead of them. Lord, we pray for our world today, and uh, we know it'll never be perfect, but we know that we as uh, believers have a mission to uh, do our part to make it uh, a better place to live and to bring people to the knowledge of you, Lord. May we do that with your Holy Spirit among us and reach out to those that are uh, out there uh, among us and just give us strength to do this, Lord. And we, we thank you for this church. We thank you for the people that are here. We thank you for, for, for Pastor Dave and, and Jill and, and the worship team today, Lord, as they, as they lead us in worship. We pray as this coming Christmas that it'll be more unique than it's ever been in our lives, Lord, that we... Uh, something special will happen to each and every one of us that we can go out and tell the world that we are believers in you and that we have no fear of that. Uh, someday soon we'll all be together worshiping you in heaven. And uh, in that truth, we get strength and the ability to go forward in what you would have us do. We just love you and thank you for uh, giving us the opportunity to be here both physically and on uh, our social media platform today, Lord, and we just thank you for being who you are. In your name we pray, amen. amen. <clears throat> okay. For many of us, the call to head home is one of hope and joy. We can't wait to reconnect with family, with history and tradition, with a wonderful time of freedom and loving support. We can't wait to go home. 
There are those who fear going home, however, and, th and there are times when going home brings back memories that are not so good, not so healing. We are reminded of when we didn't fit in, when we didn't measure up, when we, when we weren't loved like we needed to be loved. Home can be a difficult place for some. The prophet Malachi tells us that even when we are in the hottest of fires, there is a presence who can make us better, who can refine and purify. John the Baptist tells us that the road home is always under construction, mountains leveled and valleys filled in to make smooth the path that leads us to our true destination, where we can live in peace and unity with, each, with, with all. We light these candles, the candle of hope and the candle of peace, as a sign of our assurance that through the road, though the road is hard, we believe it is worth the journey. It's time to go home. a small responsive reading. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. us. Let's stand together as we sing out to him this morning.
stone light is breaking in a stable for a throne and he shall reign The King of kings and Lord of lords, and he shall reign forevermore, forevermore. If I were a wise man, I would travel far, and if I were Again, we thank you for being here today to uh, worship with us. Um, time of prayer and praises. I hope we have lots more uh, praises than prayer requests, but I know as human beings we have a lot of challenges that uh, God would have us go through. Um, in the bulletin, we have uh, many that we've been remembering, like Gary Weller and uh, and Kathleen Dowdy and uh, Charlie and Linda and Mark and... Uh, Tom and Tiana, and you can read the list there. And uh, again, we want to continue to pray for our country and our world as we are seeing things happen on a daily basis. And I just challenge us today that we, uh, if somebody walked up to you and said, who are you? What would you start out with? Would you start out with, I'm a believer? Or would that be at the bottom of your list? And uh, I just, I'm challenging myself as well, Lord. Give us the strength to uh, tell him, tell the world who we are and who controls our, our life. Here's a new uh, prayer request for Nancy Sullivan in the hospital with pneumonia. And this is from Kay Matthews. Uh, let's remember Nancy this morning. Uh, let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Lord, we come to you today on this beautiful December morning, and we just ask that you fill our hearts with uh, praise and thanksgiving for sending your son 
in the form of a baby uh, to grow up and to uh, die for our sins. And Lord, uh, may we as Christians be willing to uh, spread that word to people in uh, the world. No matter what they're looking for in the world today, they're not going to find what they're looking for in anything from money to jobs to anything without you in control of that, Lord. And we just pray that we have the ability to uh, reach our friends with, with those words and, and that challenge, Lord. I know uh, we are challenged daily in this world by the uh, roaring lion of Satan, uh, always in the earth and, and doing things uh, like COVID and, and different things to challenge us, Lord. But that just makes it... Uh, more of a praise when we we come through those times lord and we just thank you for uh giving us the strength to do that lord we we pray for um nancy this morning nancy sullivan who has pneumonia lord just give her strength and lift her up lord we also pray for gary we know he wants to be here but uh just can't be here because of his breathing difficulties lord and uh just give him strength through um uh be rejuvenated and, and spread the word for you, Lord. Lord, we want to thank you for Pastor Dave and as he shares the message with us, with us today, Lord, that uh, we may each leave, leave, leave here today with new, uh, renewed strength and hope in your word, Lord. And uh, again, we thank you for who you are and for uh, giving us the strength to be here today, Lord, that we can be in person and worship you and we thank for thankful for all those people watching us online, Lord. Lord, give us strength. Thank you for sending your son to be in flesh, to be with us and dwell among us, Lord, that we may ha we would have an example to know what to do in this world today. We just thank you and love you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. Today I wanted to talk to you about a sign from God. And this is a story from the Old Testament, but it actually leads to the story of Jesus' birth. And so here in this time of Christmas, when we've heard that story so often, let's go to a part of the story that may not be as accessible for all of us. Let's go back to the divided kingdom. If you're familiar with the Old Testament, you know that after the time of Judges, people of Israel wanted a king, so they got a king, even though God told them they didn't really want it. They, they shouldn't have it. First king was Saul, then David, then Solomon. But after those three kings, the nation of Israel broke apart. And the northern tribes called Israel were governed by a king who was illegitimate. And the southern two tribes called Judah were still governed by the line of David, the, the king that God had appointed and the, the dynasty that God said would last forever. It was a legitimate dynasty. As you read the story through First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, you realize that most of the kings of the northern kingdom, Israel, also sometimes called Ephraim, which is one of the ten tribes, and um, symbolically they use that term sometimes, that those kings were generally evil. Generally. And the kings of Judah, in David's lines, were generally good but not today. Because today we're going to talk about King Ahaz. Ahaz was not good. Uh, he lived in the second half of the 8th century, so about 700 years before Jesus came. He would have been ancient history by the time of Jesus' time. We actually have historical record from archaeology about Ahaz. If you'd put that up there, Jane. This is an interesting thing. It's called a bulla. Have you ever signed a, a letter and sealed it with wax and a seal? This is similar to that, only it's not wax, it's made out of clay. Now generally, those would have just disintegrated, but this one must have been caught on a fire somewhere and the clay was actually fired hot enough that it became ceramic. And that bulla is actually the seal of King Ahaz from 2,700 years ago. Just a, just a cool thing here. If you look to the left of that, outside the circle, do you see that there's lines? They've analyzed that very carefully, and they say that's a fingerprint. 
So we may, we may actually have a fingerprint from King Ahaz. Might, may have been one of his servants, but that actually might be Ahaz's fingerprint. So um, again, these are stories that are steeped in history. They are stories right out of the historical record. They're not fables. And so since they're rooted in history, we can see that these are real people that, that dealt with real problems. Ahaz, in his time, was facing a northern kingdom of Israel that was also evil, but they were far from God. And um, I think Ahaz, in the time of this story, was just making his choice on who he was going to serve. Um, the big dog in the area, the, the dangerous country in the area, was Assyria. Assyria was a nation of iron. They had developed iron tools and weapons, and they were more, much more powerful than the other nations. And so Aram and Israel, the northern kingdom, decided to unite together to be defensive against Assyria. And they asked Ahaz to join them in that alliance. And Ahaz said, no. And so Israel and Aram united and decided to attack Judah and take them by force, and then they would have a bigger conglomeration that they could stand up against Assyria. And uh, Rezin was the king of Aram, and Pekah was the king of Israel, also known as Ephraim, and uh, they decided to take Judah by force. And that's where I want to start this reading. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 7, starting with verse 1. When Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah, was king of Judah, King Rezin of Aram and Pekah, son of Remaliah, king of Israel, marched up to fight against Jerusalem, but they could not overpower it. Now the house of David, remember that's Ahaz, the house of David was told, Aram has allied itself with Ephraim. So the hearts of Ahaz and his people were shaken as the trees of the forest are shaken by the wind. They were scared. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out, you and your son Shear Jeshub, to meet Ahaz at the end of the aqueduct of the upper pool on the road to the launderer's field. Say to him, Be careful. Keep calm and don't be afraid. Don't lose heart because of these two smoldering stubs of firewood, because of the fierce anger of Rezin and Aram and the son and of the son of Remaliah. Aram, Ephraim, and Remaliah's son have plotted your ruin, saying, Let us invade Judah, let us tear it apart and divide it among ourselves, and make the son of Tabeel king over it. Yet this is what the sovereign Lord says. It will not take place. It will not happen. For the head of Aram is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is only resin. Within 65 years, Ephraim will be too shattered to be a people. The head of Ephraim is Samaria, and the head of Samaria is only Remaliah's son. If you do not stand firm in your faith, you will not stand at all. The prophet Isaiah who, who lived during the time of Ahaz, came to Ahaz and said, here's what God has told me. Israel and Aram want to destroy you and your nation. But this is what God says. You ever see that bumper sticker that says, God said it, I believe it, that settles it? You know, you could just have a bumper sticker that says, God said it, that settles it. Because it doesn't matter whether we believe it or not, if God says it, it's going to happen. He said, this is what God says. It will not happen. Israel, by 65 years from now, won't even be a people. It was actually much sooner than that that they were destroyed as a nation. But he said, they're not even going to be a people anymore. During the time of Jesus, there was no northern kingdom of Israel. It was Samaria. They were destroyed, the ten lost tribes. He said, don't worry about it. Aram is going to be destroyed as well. And the, the message of this section here is that no power can stand against God's will. It doesn't matter if it's Assyria or Aram or Israel or all of them together. No power can stand against God's will. You know, Israel should have been their ally. Israel should have been on the same side. But here they are attacking them 
because they, they're afraid of Assyria. He says, these people think that they're a destructive fire, the, the fiery anger. He said, they're just smoldering firewood, just little pieces of charcoal that are just burning out in the fire. And then he says something interesting. The head of Aram is Damascus. That's the capital. And the head of Damascus is only Rezin, the king. Well, that's kind of normal, right? Every nation has a capital and every nation has a chief government official. The head of Ephraim, or Israel, is Samaria. That's the capital city. And the head of Samaria is only, and he doesn't even say his name, Pekah. He says only Remaliah's son. Kind of dismissive. Like, why are you worried about these people? What's the implication? What does this mean? What it means is, Judah's capital is Jerusalem, the city of the living God. And the king of Jerusalem is the one who sits on the throne of David, the king that God has appointed not only for Judah and Israel, but for the whole world, that one day he will rule the whole world. What Isaiah is implying here, and if you read in the Chronicles and Kings and everything else, you get the whole picture, that Isaiah is telling Ahaz, don't make an alliance. Don't give the loyalty of your country to another country. Your alliance is with God and you will be able to stand firm in your faith. If you can't stand in your faith, you won't stand at all. And what we find out from the historical record and, and other places in the Bible is that Ahaz's decision, he was toying with the idea of having an, an alliance with Assyria. Why do I want to join with Israel and, and, and Aram? Let's have an alliance with the big guy and then I'll be safe. And so that's the choice he's facing. And, and Isaiah is saying, don't. Don't make that alliance. You have to stand firm. Ahaz finds out, the same as all of us do, that everything depends on where you put your trust. Where do you put your trust? Ahaz was thinking of putting his trust with Assyria. Isaiah said, don't trust it. Trust God. Where is your trust today? Too many believers put their faith elsewhere. They put it in their stock portfolio or their finances. They put it in their, their government. They put their, their faith in some great politician. They put their faith in uh, their own self, their own plans. We, we can put our faith in so many things that all can fail us. But if we put our faith in God, he will never fail us. Um, you know, we are praying right now for the Supreme Court. They're making a decision about the life of the unborn. And I think it's legitimate to pray about that. But my faith is not in the Supreme Court. My faith is in God. And God's will is going to be done in the end. Some people trust in fame or celebrity. Some people trust in super leaders. We, we want celebrity leaders who are like, they're the greatest thing since sliced bread, and then they fail us. It's okay to have leadership, but we don't put our trust in them. We put our trust in God. Let's go on to verse 10. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz. Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or the highest heights. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David, is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. He will be eating curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. For be before the boy knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right, the land of the king's you dread will be laid waste. The Lord will bring on you and on your people and on the house of your father a time unlike any since Ephraim broke away from Judah. He will bring the king of Assyria. 
So Isaiah says, here's what God says to you. Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether the highest heights or the deepest depths. What, no matter what you want in this world, ask God for a sign and I'll give it to you so that you know you can trust me. You know, Jesus said, a wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. His idea was you shouldn't always be asking God to prove himself. And actually, the Bible does say, don't put the Lord your God to the test. But here is God saying, I'm going to make a special case for you, Isaiah, or Ahaz. And Isaiah is conveying this message. If you don't trust me, ask me for a sign and I will prove it to you that I will fight for you and you will win. And Ahaz, it sounds like he's being holy because he quotes scripture to justify it. I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. And if we didn't know better, we would think that was the right answer. But we realize Isaiah is speaking from God's voice. And and he says, are you going to try the patience of God? God told you to ask for a sign. And you won't do it. What motive would he have? For me, the only motive is he didn't trust God. He didn't want a sign because he was trusting in himself and in his alliance that he was planning with Assyria and and he wasn't going to have anything to do with it. He wasn't going to be one of those religious nuts that just trusted in God. This is the real world. I heard about a man up in Ohio that uh, he was a businessman and he was kind of doing underhanded things in his business, but he was a church member. And one day, one of his fellow brothers and sisters in Christ asked him and kind of confronted him and said, how can you make these decisions as a businessman when you're a Christian? And he said, this is business. God doesn't work in the real world, was his implication. I can't trust in doing the right thing. That will put me at a disadvantage And I think that's the attitude Ahaz is showing here when he says, I will not put the Lord God to the test. And Isaiah says, you're going to trust, you're going to try God's patience as well as human patience. Another little subtle thing here. Notice the change in the possessive pronoun. The Lord spoke to Ahaz, it says, meaning Isaiah was speaking, but it was actually the words of God. Ask the Lord your God for a sign. Speaking to Ahaz, the Lord your God. And he says, I won't ask for a sign. And Isaiah says, hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? Isaiah couldn't bring himself to say your God again. It was at this point that Isaiah realized Ahaz was solidified in his decision, I'm going to do what I think is best, not what God thinks. And so he said, there, um, will you try the patience of my God also? Ahaz allied with Syria. He left Judah, he left Israel and Aram to the tender mercies of Assyria to invade, and they did. And Assyria destroyed them both. But Ahaz corrupted Judah by doing this. Because this was the turning point in his life where he started worshiping Assyrian gods, even bringing the Assyrian gods into the temple. He was such a terrible king that he set up high places to false gods all the way through Judah because he wanted this alliance with Assyria. From that point on, Judah was a puppet kingdom of the Assyrian Empire. Uh, he was, the prophecy here was, the Lord will bring on you and on your people and on the house of your father a time unlike any since Ephraim broke away from Judah. When Ephraim broke away from Judah, 10 of the 12 tribes left the house of David. It was a civil war that was successful and they were never united again. Only two tribes were left. But now his reign is going to be shrunk even further because eventually Assyria will come to take what is theirs, what they've claimed. It will shrink even more. Assyria ruled over Judah until 586 BC. So over a century later, Babylon came and destroyed it. 
So here, back to this story, Isaiah says, all right, you're not going to ask for a sign, I'll give you a sign. The Lord will give you a sign. A virgin will conceive. And we know what it's talking about. 700 years later, a virgin conceived and gave birth to Jesus. And I've always read this and I've always thought, what good does that sign do Ahaz? <laughs> what, the idea of a sign is you get to see the sign and then you say, wow, if God can do that, then I can trust that he's going to take care of me. Ahaz didn't live to see 700 years later, a virgin conceived and gave birth to a son named Emmanuel. He didn't see it. And that's the point. When one person refuses God's will, God uses someone else. Ahaz has decided, I'm not going to rest on God's wisdom or protection. And Isaiah says, okay, the sign's going to be this. And he gives a sign for seven centuries down the road. When the prophecy came true, the heir to David's throne was born to a young woman engaged to a carpenter. The prophecy was that he will be eating curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the right from the wrong. I, I really struggled with that one too. Then as I was studying it, I, I was told that curds and honey is an expression of baby food. This is what you would feed a little baby before solid food. So before he gets through with baby food, before he starts on solid food, he's going to be so righteous that he will know right from wrong at that point. Before he even reaches any age of accountability, he's going to be doing the right thing. He'll be a righteous baby and grow up to be a righteous man. Here was Ahaz, an adult, he, who didn't know right from wrong. Before Jesus was on solid food, he did. And then the final part of the prophecy is, and he will be called Emmanuel. Of course, we know that wasn't his name, but it is a description of him. God with us. And the prophecy came through. Matthew 1, 18 through 25 talks about the prophecy. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. The name Jesus is a form of Joshua. It means the Lord saves. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home and his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. So Ahaz brought the destruction of his people. He trusted in himself and his own plans. He trusted in his alliance with other people. And it served to diminish his throne and to destroy his country eventually. On the other hand, Jesus brought the salvation of his people. Ahaz didn't want to be used by God. God found somebody else. And 700 years later, a virgin gave birth to the Savior of not only his own people, but the world. So we have the same question today. You have the same question as Ahaz. Where is your trust? Are you trusting in him? And it matters because who you trust makes a difference in the decisions you make and how you live your life. Jesus is called God with us because he is fully God and he's also fully one of us. He is with us. Then you think about, you know, I, I know it's going to come true because God told us that 700 years before it happened. But why did God decide this was the way to save the world? Why did he have to be God with us? And I think that's an important thing for us to be thinking about. 
Why was this God's plan? I believe Jesus had to identify with us because he had to be one of us to pay the price for our sins. He had to be the one human being that ever lived that never had sinned. I've been thinking recently about all the heroes we have and there's fights about what kind of statues to take down and and what type of people that we should vilify in history and whether we should celebrate Columbus Day or Thanksgiving Day and, and how all of our heroes have their own problems. You know, we'll never have a hero without problems in this world because every one of us is a sinner. Except for one. Jesus who lived the righteous life and then he was able to give his life for our sins. Because he was one of us, he understands us as well. Hebrews 4, 14 following says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. NIV used to translate this, that we have a high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses. To, to sympathize with our weaknesses, and I, I, they changed it to empathize, and I'm glad that they did. Here's the reason. They're almost the same word, but empathize has come to mean something different. Sympathize means I feel for somebody. If I see somebody who's poor and begging on the street, I might feel like, oh, that's sad that they're like that. Whereas empathize means you feel with them. I've been there. I understand. I know what it's like to be poor. That's the difference between the words, and that's exactly the point. Jesus lived life on this earth so he can empathize with all of our weaknesses. Tempted in every way, yet was without sin. If you've ever been tempted and you think, oh, this temptation is too hard, Jesus understood. He understands. Have you ever been hungry? Well, Jesus went 40 days without food. I think he understands hunger. Thirsty. He was thirsty on the cross. He was tired. There were times that he just had to get away. And he'd get away and then another crowd would form. And he was like, oh, this is too much. Because he was human. You ever put up with slander or the disdain of others? Jesus did. His own people rejected him. Have you ever been betrayed by a friend? friend of Jesus turned him in to be killed. I think he understands that. Another friend denied him. The best of his friends abandoned him at the end. Jesus understands if you have trouble with people that say they love you and then they don't live up to that. Jesus understands. You ever deal with depression? Jesus was, was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. He understands sorrow. Ever deal with failure? Think about Jesus. The crowds are gone. The city has turned against him. And they turn him over to the Romans to be killed. And as he's on that cross, they say to him, if you really are the son of God, why don't you come down out of, off of that cross? Saying, we got you now. You're a failure. We know it wasn't a failure. But we know they all looked at him as a failure. Have you ever gone through pain? Some of you go through chronic pain. Jesus understands pain. All these things and everything else we've ever dealt with, Jesus understands. And whenever I think about God with us, that's what I think about the, the beauty of God's plan to rescue us. He came to be one of us and dealt with everything we deal with in this cursed world. And he understands. There was a song many years ago by Harvest, the Christian group Harvest, that had lyrics, for, uh, the song was titled, Know That I Am God. And the song just has a beautiful poetry about it. I want to close with that. It says, Behold, I am the Lord. I stop the wind, I still the storm. No weapon that is ever formed against you will prevail. 
So if in darkness you lose your way, the river rises, don't be afraid. I've walked the deepest parts of every river that can rage. When you're broken and all alone, your love has faded, your strength is gone. Remember, I gave my only son that you might know. The storms will come, the rains will fall, but in your darkest hour of all, lift your eyes and know that I am God. Thank you, Father, that in our troubled times, we can be sure that we have a God who understands. Thank you, Lord, that we can turn to you. And no matter what storm we're going through, no matter what river we're being washed down, you know what it's like, and you are good to save. We lift up our eyes to you, Father, and we know that you are God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our closing song is, I Need You. Would you all stand with us as we sing? If you have any needs, um, if you want to talk about any uh, issues or need prayer, uh, I'll be here after this service and, and we can pray together. Uh, but let's sing this together as a, as a reminder that we need him every moment of every day, but we do have him. And that's the, that's the promise that we have from him.
we've been praying for Dolores, Iris's friend who's suffering from diabetes and poor circulation. Um, Dolores had her leg amputated yesterday. So let's pray for her. Father, we thank you for this time together. Thank you, Lord, that we can share the joys and also the, the trials and struggles. And Father, the joys are doubled when we share them and the trials and struggles are halved. We just pray, Lord, that we would lift up and, and present Dolores to you that she would have your help and healing. And Father, I know that this is also a, a prayer concern for Iris. Bless her, Father, as she seeks to minister to her friend. And Lord, give her the strength in her heart to be a comfort. And Father, we just pray for this. We pray for each person who's here and those who are watching and listening. I pray, Father, that we would put our full trust in you and trust that you are the one that we can uh, follow and obey, and that will lead to the best abundant life. Go with us now, Lord, and dismiss us with your blessing. We pray all this in Jesus' precious name. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen.